initially, we asked people to, des uh, to describe their experiences at the very beginning of the experiences. How was it? 38% said it was mainly negative. Okay? Four out of ten people said it was mainly negative. Okay? Then we asked them to describe their experiences now. Okay? Many, many years later. And what happened, depending on the questions that was asked, anywhere from between 85 to 95% of the people said it was not negative. So you think it's basically boils down to when it happens, it's scary as the hell. The first experience is scary as hell. You see one of these entities in front of you, physical entities, and, uh, and all of a sudden uh, you're scared. You know, obviously, it's, it's natural. But what we discovered in our survey is that even the vast majority of, of these individuals have had more than one experience. Um, actually, 40% have had more than 20 experiences. So uh, in time, the experience changes. Uh, what we discovered is for many individuals that had physical experiences with non-human intelligence, that um, these were uh, medical checkups. What, what we would call in the genre an abduction and you were placed on a table, you were paralyzed and you were inspected. The people that only had one or two of these types of experiences, those were the most traumatized. Okay? But then uh, many of these people then all of a sudden uh, were brought to, to crafts, were walking around perceived crafts. Uh, they then began to interact with human looking beings, not with the short grays. The transition is towards then the, the human looking beings later on. And then, uh, with many, many people, they were brought to other realities, what we call matrix realities. Um, and uh, almost double the number of people that have had an abductions were brought to these matrix realities. So uh, then they were taught like spiritual lessons, uh, almost like having like NDEs, but it was uh, related to, you know, a, a, a physical being that appeared in front of you, a human looking being. What? So that's why at the end, these people said, look, in the beginning, I was scared to wits uh, by these experiences, but then later on, they had a whole total transformation. And uh, John has a book back there by Dr. Kenneth Ring, Heading Towards Omega. Dr. Kenneth Ring, um, I'm sure you're familiar with, okay? He wrote a book in 1986 titled The Omega Project. And what he did in that book, he compared uh, approximately 85 people that had NDE experiences with 85 people that had uh, abduction type of experiences. And uh, he asked many type of, uh, types of questions, but one of the areas that he focused on was how do these people change from once the experience has started to, to right now. And what he discovered was that uh, it was a total transformation of the personality profile of the individual. Uh, for example, people like in my case, total atheist, they become spiritual. People that were religious, they become very spiritual. People that were materialistic, all of a sudden, money is not important. People with immense egos, all of a sudden diminished egos. Loving and caring to your fellow human br brethren, all of a sudden, you know, they're very loving and caring. So it's a total transformation for both groups he discovered, but both the NDE folks and the abduction folks. I'm sure you've asked yourself, hey, how can we step it up and have more of this? <laughs> well, because <laughs> It seems yes. to be in short supply, all that most stuff you definitely, described. Most definitely. What we, what we did is we took 60 of, of those questions on how did these people change and evolve from his book. And guess what? The same statistics, the same numbers showed up with the people that took our survey. Why don't we do this? Why don't you start with sort of the broad strokes of what this project was, what you set out to do, and what you found. Okay. Um, I was at the home of Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Um, I was at his home more than 20 times before he passed away. I also was there a few days before he passed away. He was in a, in a hospital in very bad condition. So Edgar and I were very close friends and we had a lot of these intimate conversations, not only about ufology and non-human intelligence, but also uh, consciousness and the paranormal. Edgar was very much inter interested in these topics from the very beginning. Um, so we, uh, I, I informed him of my experiences in detail. Uh, he then told me, and a lot of people don't know this, that he has spoken with hundreds of experiencers, just like Jacques Vallée, not only studying the ufology part of it, but also the experiencer side. Except Edgar never publicly d discussed the details of that. And then um, he told me, don't worry, you're not going crazy. These experiences are very, very real. I've heard it from many, many other individuals. And then I said, uh, Edgar, but I did uh, what is called an academic literature review of this, of what has been written academically about the experiencer contact phenomenon. And he says, Ray, it doesn't exist. 
I said, but, but Edgar, that's hard to believe. <laughs> How could, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are having these experiences worldwide and academics have uh, not been interested in this. And that's, it hasn't been documented. He says, well, we have a lot of personal uh, anecdotal stories, mainly about the abduction, abduction phenomenon, but nothing about the whole complexities of the experiences that are having. You also so, have a, a reluctance on the part of professionals and academics to study it. Correct, correct. And Rudy Shields, who's our executive director of our organization, he's one of the rare uh, exceptions to this. Um, and so Edgar said, look, Ray, what we really need is to undertake a comprehensive academic research study of the experiencer because he knows it's not just nuts and bolts. It's not just a materialist phenomenon. And he told me, uh, he said from the people that he has spoken with, he suspected that it was primarily a paranormal phenomenon, a psychic phenomenon, a consciousness phenomenon. And he took that route because he started the Institute for Noetic Sciences. He's been researching consciousness for 30 years or more. You know, remote viewing, he was one of the pioneers of, of, uh, of remote viewing when he was at the Stanford Research Center. So it was at the home of Edgar Mitchell that, um, how should I say, that the seed of this was planted. And then he helped me to get Rudy Shields uh, involved, integrated into our work. Uh, we got Dr. John Klimo, who had taught um, uh, the paranormal, basically, uh, for 40 years. He was a full tenured professor, and he had taught research methodology. And so I, said, I talked to John afterwards, and I said, John, would you like to become the chair of this research project, which we don't have an idea what we're going to be doing, but would you like to at least lead that charge? So over time, we uh, got numerous uh, academics, mainly retired academics. Another one was Dr. Bob Davis, uh, a retired professor of neuroscience that had uh, just written a book about UFOs, but also was interested in the paranormal and consciousness. Um, and, and, and Dean Radin was a consultant uh, for our work. Um, and then um, we brought in other um, individuals that had researched this phenomenon at the ground level. People like Leo Sprinkle, which you know, people like Kathy Martin, uh, people like Mary Rodwell, etc. Um, uh, um, Denise Stoner, who had uh, partnered with Kathy to do a research study of uh, uh, abductees. So uh, Barbara Lamb became involved. Um, uh, so it was a very large team that basically got together and we started with the question is, how do you start? <laughs> how do you begin to research individuals that have seen UFOs and have contact with non-human intelligence? So over a pretty much uh, nine months, we spent developing the research methodology with the academics and the people who had their, the boots in the ground. Do you start with the premise that these uh, experiences are generally... I'm sorry, George. Could you restate? Yeah. Do you start with the premises? Do you, uh, did you start with the premise that these experiences are actually positive, um, even though they might be perceived as negative to begin with, and that's your starting point and you're going to see if the data supports it? No, no. We, we actually took the opposite approach. Our approach that we know nothing about this phenomenon. Everything that, um, that themselves as researchers, you know, Leo, Kathy, Marion, throw that all in the wastebasket and let's start from scratch from what people have told you and begin to develop questions to uh, extract that information. Because uh, all of them said that, yes, there was a certain percentage of people that perceived their experiences as negative, certain percentage, a very large percentage, uh, saw their experiences over time as positive. A lot of people talk about uh, the materialist aspect of the phenomenon, of seeing the crafts, of seeing the beings. Uh, a good majority of the people talked about the paranormal experiences that happened afterwards. Um, you know, being taken out of their body, having OBEs, uh, having near-death experiences, uh, being brought to other matrix realities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how do we get the totality of these experiences and begin to develop questions without any precondi uh, preconditions? Also, how do you get people to cooperate? Because, I mean, these are sometimes embarrassing. People don't want to be thought of as crazy. Mm -hmm. For those who've had a negative experience, they're scared about talk, sharing it. Uh, many, I would imagine, don't even tell their own families. Correct. What we found out was that the vast majority of people that took our surveys have never told anyone except their immediate family members. Um, our survey was anonymous. It didn't ask for their name, their mailing address, social security number, telephone numbers, that sort of thing. Uh, we also developed three surveys. 
in order to do the three surveys, it would take you, for example, for phase one and phase two, the average was approximately uh, six to eight hours for most people that completed all of the answers. So it took a very long time. And phase one and two were the quantitative. We had 600 quantitative questions. Then we had a phase three. Phase three was the qualitative questions. We had 70 open-ended questions. For the vast majority of these people, it took them several days to answer these questions. Um, we received almost 1,400 responses for our qualitative questions, the open-ended questions. For phase one, we received 4,200 responses from individuals from over 100 countries. And this is just for English language survey. We did the survey in multiple languages. So if uh, even, let's say, 5% of the people wanted to, to trick us, you know, <laughs> to... Uh, so it's a big sample. It was a huge sample. So even if it was 5%, what's 5% of 4,200? All right, give me, yeah. give me the laundry list of the, the, the things that jumped out at you, the, the conclusions that were Well, reached. we have four major uh, uh, findings. research findings. Well, we could go into hundreds of them, but the right. four major ones is that uh, we asked uh, almost uh, 25 questions re related to the question of positive, negative, or neutral. Was your experience positive or negative or neutral? We asked it in more than 25 different ways because depending on how you ask the question, you get different responses. Okay? So um, what we uh, found out was that the responses was between 85% that were not negative to 95% that were not negative. We also found out was that in the very beginning of the experiences, 38% responded that their experiences were negative, perceived as highly negative, 38%. But then when we asked the individual now, what is your perception now? That number dwindled to, like what I said before, between 85 to 95% not, not negative. Uh, uh, a good majority of the responses, uh, with, depending on the question asked, was between 50 to 60 percent was neutral. So it wasn't that it was positive either. It was uh, positive was depending between 35 to, to 45 percent was positive experiences. But neutral was the largest of the three categories. But the negative was actually the, the smallest part. We also discovered that over time, um, uh, we had a statistician, Dr. Russell Scalpone, who uh, uh, worked with us. Uh, we had a paper that was published with Dr. Bob Davis, Dr. John Klimo, and Rudy Shield, and myself, and was published in the Journal of the Society for Scientific Exploration, which I'm sure you're familiar with that journal. Jack Vallee has published extensively in that, and Dr. Dean Radin. And so he was part of our team that reviewed our data, and he was a co-author in that article. Uh, obviously, we took out the, um, the emails for the participants, um, and uh, he did several types of statistical studies to gauge the, the validity of it. One was that um, he grouped them in country code, uh, not country code, excuse me, uh, geographic region. He put all the individuals from, in the English language survey, from Europe, from Canada, from the United States, from Great Britain, and then from New Zealand and Australia. And he uh, reviewed how people answered the questions over time. And what he found out was that it was consistent. It was a 10% variance between uh, the answer response for all the questions, all over the countries, over time. So people were, asked, uh, were responding consistently, over time, doesn't matter what geographic region you were in. He also did a statistical analysis of the people that had uh, viewed their experiences as mainly negative, as neutral or positive, and then he reviewed it with how many experiences you had. And, uh, and I have a, 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 a bar graph showing that in my presentation. It shows the more experiences you have, the more positive was your response. You get used to it. You're used to it. And also, not only that, but your experiences change. Remember I told you that yeah. for many people, it was the physicality of it, as Dr. John Mack calls the ontological shock. That was, you know, the horror of it, you know. And then later on, you're not on the slab being expected. You know, now other uh, experiences uh, occur. And then over time, the human looking being appears. Um, so what changes is how they treat you. How they treat you. It's your, your medical inspections are already done. <laughs> uh, the little grays are, are done with you. Then uh, for uh, many, many of the cases, the, then there's different types of interactions with the um, uh, um, vast majority of the cases, human looking beings. As a matter of fact, in our survey, we asked what was the number one type of being seen by individuals? The number one at 55% was the energy being. Number two at 52% was the human looking being. 
Number three was the short grays at 51%. Uh, but the short grays were in the very beginning of people's experiences were the number one type of entity C. As time developed, then it wasn't the short grays anymore. Then it was other types of beings. So it's sort of the equivalent of you're a, you're a mouse in a lab, you've got a disease, somebody comes and plucks you out of the, out of the cage, experiments with you, sticks a needle in you, puts you back. And heal you. We've and had, it heals you over time, but you don't know until later down the well, road. 50% uh, of the people that took our surveys had a medical healing. Um, like like I told you, Healings uh, for what? You name it, all types. We've had three medical doctors that took our surveys. Uh, Joe, as a matter of fact, did an uh, in-depth, Dr. Joseph Burks, who's a retired medical doctor, did an in-depth survey of one of these medical doctors who I know. Um, uh, and he saw his medical records, um, his medical credentials, you know, to prove that he's a medical doctor, even though he was a friend of mine. Joe had to see all of that. So we went over the details of his medical healing. Um, and uh, we had many cases, cancer cases. Um, um, uh, Chris Bledsoe, I'm sure you're familiar with his case of the, uh, of the Crohn's disease. So people have cancer and the cancer is gone. Yes. Also near death experiences there have been, you know, numerous cases. We interviewed Raymond Moody and Dr. Jeffrey Long and they said that's one of the major uh, uh, phenomenon of the NDE phenomenon. Many people that have had uh, a significant disease, they're told um, in their interactions with this energy being, the number one being seen in, in UFO contact experiences, also in an NDE, that um, when you go back, don't worry about your cancer, don't worry about whatever disease you've got, it's all taken care of. It, are the healings the reason for these interactions? Or do you, I'm just, I'm I, asking I, I you to guess. So. I don't think so. I, I think it's, it's just a side effect. I think it's a side aspect of it, that when they do a physical inspection uh, of you, um, though they detect you know, something, an, an anomalous problem with you, and they take care of it. Uh, not obviously everyone. We don't know the, these, the answers to these questions of why one person, why another person. But, but what we gathered in our survey was that uh, this is an extremely complex phenomenon. So that was the first finding, that it was overwhelmingly a, 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 a not negative phenomenon. It was either a, a neutral primarily and uh, like 40, depending on the question, 40 to 50 percent was, uh, was positive experiences. Number two was that these experiences were primarily not physical. The experiences were primarily paranormal. Uh, like in my case, I saw this energy being in my living room and I saw uh, twice huge UFOs. One time a, a football stadium sized UFO that was 30 feet away from us, from my daughter, myself and three friends. So that's the physical aspect of it. But what happened when I saw that physical being, that, that physical um, um, uh, UFO, uh, UFO on a, uh, UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, there was mind-to-mind -mind communication that took place. Uh, there what were, was said? Uh, well, it's a lengthy story, oh, but, yeah. but, but, but uh, lengthy story, but basically there was mind to mind. Um, and then also they put uh, thoughts in my mind as well. Like, for example, they wanted to get rid of me, how to leave. And they put in my mind that thousands of mosquitoes were attacking me. Um, and I was slapping my legs in my shorts. And I was like, go, went to my daughter. I said, let's get out of here. These mosquitoes are killing me. So it's when we go inside that I'm telling my wife what had happened. And my daughter overhears it. She goes, Daddy, there were no mosquitoes outside. And all of a sudden, it's like the hypnotist snapped his finger. And all of a sudden, you're conscious of your reality. So I was placed in some type of a daze where uh, I was interacting and physically seeing and, and thinking. But yet the, um, the, the pictures, we all had cell phones. The teenager that was with us, a 17-year-old, had her uh, iPhone in her hand. No one took a picture or a video of this. Okay, and then how they got me to leave was they put this thought into me. Um, but then while you're experiencing this, you don't realize the significance of the consequences. You think if you took a picture that you would, you would catch an image, that you would actually capture an well, image? Well, lots of people have actually captured, you know, physical pictures of, 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 of these um, physical phenomenon that they're seeing. But the, the, the point that I'm getting at is that what a lot of people don't understand is um, just like CE5, people go out to a desert and they call down uh, craft or non-human intelligence and 15 minutes later it showed up. That's what happened in my case, okay? And then the thought patterns that, that took place, the telepathic communications, these types of complexities no one really has fully developed in the field of, 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 
of ufology, we were able to document it, a lot of that uh, uh, paranormal aspect of it. And that's just one component. Uh, what we discovered was that, for example, just to give you an illustration of the primary, primacy of the paranormal, 80% of the individual, individuals that took our survey said that they've had an out-of-body experience. Okay? Telepathic communications, 67%, almost two out of three individuals, two out of three people said that they've had telepathic you know, communications, downloads, telepathic downloads of information. Again, another two-thirds of the people. Uh, I could go on and on. You name all the paranormal phenomenon, these people have had it. These are their experiences prior to their encounter? Uh, or it happens after or both? the vast majority after some of them have had before but at a very limited basis it seems like either the nd and uh, um, 37 percent have had an nde okay uh, of the individuals for the vast majority of people that have had an nde it seems like the nde triggered the paranormal experiences the people that have had these ufo you know you see a ufo right and all of a sudden Boom, the triggering effect takes place where these paranormal experiences are then accelerated. That was, uh, again, we're not able to fully document it because our survey was still quite limited, 600 questions and, and 70 open-ended questions. But these are hypotheses that we gathered from the open-ended responses that we want to pursue later on. Uh, but that's sort of a hypothesis that we have, that these are tricking mechanisms. So number two, number one is that these were overwhelmingly positive and not negative experiences. Number two, the phenomenon is primarily paranormal, ethereal, conscious phenomenon, and not physical phenomenon, even though they do exist, okay, with everybody. Uh, number three, these experiences were, primar uh, were, were also uh, transformational for the individual. Their personality profile was completely transformed. And all you need to do is to read uh, Dr. Kenneth Ring's book, The Omega Project, again, and read his findings. We duplicated exactly those research findings. You had a total transformation of the person, even people that have had abductions. Okay, What we discovered was that 70% of the people that have had abduction experiences okay, now call themselves contactees, not abductees. Why? Because their experiences evolved over time and changed. It's the people that have only had a few experiences, mainly just the physical, paralyzed inspection. They're still horrified to this day. You know the stories, the stories that are, have been so popularized in best-selling books yep. and, and movies. The, the abductions is a harrowing and frightening yes. experience. Yes, the beyond a shadow of a doubt. dark motives that are brought up, the idea of uh, genetic manipulation and hybrid beings and things of that sort. Any feedback like that from well, your group? My, my, my response is to look at Whitley Strieber. Okay? Whitley Strieber began with these horrifying experiences. He was put uh, on, on the whole circuit of radio interviews, lecture circuits, whatever. So people perceive the experience as that, you know, the horrifying type of experience. Look at Whitley Strieber now. Whitley Strieber is love and light, spirituality. His experiences over time evolved and changed. Uh, he still gets lots of, of contact experiences, but now it's related to spirit, okay? Um, to something totally, totally different. And he's still interacting with non-human intelligence, but it's an evolution of it. That's what we have in our book with the vast majority of people. And that's what uh, really that information has not been circulating. And people don't know about that. Why? Because it's never been documented. Because Leo Sprinkle knew about that because he'd been working with people that had these evolutionary type of experiences, Barbara Lamb, Mary Rodwell, but it was never documented. They had hypotheses, but they never had the raw data. So now we've got the data. Let's do the other two the, uh, conclusions. Yes. Bras. Yes. Now the last one, we, I gave you the, the, okay. the first three. The last one was that just like Jacques Vallée stated, okay, these experiences involve a manipulation of space-time, okay? And the hypothesis from that is that at least some of, the, of this non-human intelligence or some form, uh, uh, some percentage of these entities of non-human intelligence, or maybe it's all of them, but uh, a certain uh, uh, portion of these experiences are multidimensional experiences, that people are being brought to other realities, that people are being taken out of uh, space and time. Um, I could give you a couple of illustrations, but in our open-ended questions, we had hundreds, hundreds of these types of examples. Um, for example, um, Giorgio is here with us, with our group, he and I had very similar experiences. We were both driving our car in Miami near uh, Route 836, which is a major highway near the airport. 
And in my case, I was taken out of my body while I was driving, okay? I was brought to a matrix reality, okay, where I was given information. And then I was plucked back. It seemed like that experience lasted half an hour, okay? But to me, the, the, the interview that I was listening to on, on national public radio did not skip a beat. So I was brought back instantaneously without any time. But yet my consciousness was taken out to another reality like an NDE type of experience, okay? Giorgio had something similar where he was in that same uh, area, 836 near the airport, but like maybe 10 blocks or 15 blocks down. And he was, uh, his, he then instantaneously listening to another interview on Spanish radio show. And uh, the interview did not skip a beat, but all of a sudden he appeared 25 miles away near Dolphin Stadium, driving his car. Okay, so taken out of space time, brought to another location without any time missing. These, uh, Denise Stoner, who you've had on your show, I'm sure, before she had an experience, which is very, very common, with uh, she and her entire family were driving in, I believe it was Colorado. Uh, it was a very a lengthy drive, uh, numerous hours. And all of a sudden, it was hours later. It was uh, six or seven hours later, and they were in a totally different uh, location. And the, her family members were trying to find out whether they had an accident, they were, they were in the hospital, whatever it was. So their car and their entire family, it was the husband, Denise, the wife, and two children, and their entire car was transported somewhere else. Um, the cinematographers uh, um, uh, that you, you've met, uh, Kevin and Helene, they told me a story where they were in Cancun coming back from Chichen Itza uh, in a rural road and all of a sudden they saw like a big gigantic moon, bright light that was coming at them at the ground level. And this is at dusk. Um, and the car uh, sputtered and the headlights were blinking low beam, high beam, low beam, high beam. And so Kevin just pulled his hand right in the middle of the road off of the steering wheel. And later on, it was six hours later, they were in their hotel in Cancun, fully clothed with uh, mud on their boots <laughs> in their bed and their car was properly parked. These types of stories in terms of vehicle, I'm just giving you one illustration of the vehicle. Uh, there are tons of these types of illustrations. But um, the more common type of illustration of manipulation of space-time was where people are being brought to these other realities, like had happened uh, uh, to me. We've had you know, stories after stories after stories. In our survey, we asked that question, and 50% of the individuals were brought to another perceived multi-dimensional reality. Is there a way to measure the frequency of these experiences, whether it's an increasing? Is there, or it's always been this way, we just, they weren't reported, so you can't really judge whether it's, there's more of yeah. it or less of it. Yeah, my best guess to this is that we, I cannot answer that question, we cannot answer that question, because no one has ever done any type of these surveys or these comprehensive statistical analysis that are, nationwide uh, basis. What I can tell you is that the vast majority of the people that took our survey and also the people I continue to communicate with because people send me emails all the time once they find out about what we're doing and I talk to these people you know all the time. I always ask them a question, have you told anyone else about this? And almost everyone, <laughs> who, Ray, who the hell am I going to tell this to? You know? What do you, I, what do, you do with this? Uh, is the idea now that you've got this, you continue the, the research gather more data, but ultimately, what do you do with it? Well, John's, uh, John Alexander's um, uh, hypotheses, and that's the hypotheses, uh, hypotheses that's shared by Dr. Edgar Mitchell before he passed away, Dr. Rudy Shields, all of the members of our board of directors, Dr. John Klimo, who's been researching the paranormal and ufology and consciousness for over 45 years, Dr. Claude Swanson, PhD physicist from Princeton, who's a member of our board, uh, Dean Radin, uh, so many other people, all of us hypothesize that uh, what we call the contact modalities, which is all the different ways that humans are piercing the veil and having contact with non-human intelligence, i.e. out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, UFO contact, remote viewing, shamanic hallucinogenic journeys, communication with ghosts and spirits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that they all share a, um, uh, a common source because all of them involve a manipulation of space-time. So the future, what needs to take place, maybe not in my generation, is that we really need to get um, academic scientists, social science researchers, uh, diversity of, of academic fields together with researchers of these phenomena to be able to study these comprehensively, holistically as one phenomenon instead of, for example, um, both Raymond Moody and, uh, and Jeffrey Long, 
two of, of what I consider the five, you know, most uh, uh, important near-death experience researchers. They also have that hypothesis, and they said, uh, "Ray, we need to be able to to be able to work as a team um, instead of um, studying just the NDE phenomenon or the psi phenomenon like Dean Baden studies. We need together. Uh, we need together to work together." And Jeffrey Long actually asked uh, uh, me whether he could join our board of directors because he's interested in doing that. Um, so that's what I would argue is that we need to be able what uh, what Dr. John Alexander has stated. We need to be able to develop a team get significant funding to do this, these types of surveys all throughout the world in multiple languages and over the long run begin to study what the hell is going on because right now we have no idea. You, you look at the UFO phenomena, the modern era anyway, since 47 people studying things in the sky and trying to figure it out and the government's done secret studies and civilians have done it and we have a lot of information and thousands and thousands of cases and millions of, of witnesses who've seen this stuff but it doesn't feel like we're any closer to understanding the big questions. Correct. Who are they? Where are they from? Why are they here? What their interest is in us? Do you know? Well, let me respond. And is it just one day? Let, let, let me respond to, to that question. Um, I think that anyone that proclaims that they have answers to these profound questions that you ask is totally clueless because we have no answers. We are just barely beginning to understand what questions to ask. That's number one. Okay. Um, number two. Um, this, the, the, the field of, of ufology, materialist mainstream ufology, which is still the vast majority of uh, the field of u ufology researchers, their perspective is, is that it's a material, material phenomenon, materialist phenomenon. So for 70 years, ufology has focused on pictures, on uh, uh, videos of, um, of metals that have fallen down, that, that type of thing. The perspective that Edgar always had, and the members of all of our board of directors, is that the key to be able, first of all, that in, in 70 years, the field of materialist ufology has contributed very little, just like you sort of implied with your question. And uh, our perspective is that the experiencer, the people that are having these experiences, that's where the nuggets are. That's where the kernels are, because they can tell you just like all the people that you've interviewed on, on your shows over the years. They've seen these things. They're able to tell you how it materialized, dematerialized, how it put thoughts into your mind, how telepathic communications take place in their native language. doesn't matter where they're from. Um, being brought to other realities, being brought to, uh, you know, to a, a perceived craft, whether these experiences are, are, um, are um, for example, uh, consciousness-based, whether they're not consciousness-based. All these questions, uh, George, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of. It's an extremely complex phenomenon, which I think, in my opinion, materialist ufology has not really understood the complexities of this phenomenon. You, know, you listed the energy beings, the human beings. There are you know, tall whites and reptilians and different kinds of creatures and animals and beings that have been described over the years. We don't really know what they look like, do they? I mean, correct, whether, correct. we don't know if those are all the same. Correct, correct. That's, uh, <laughs> for example, uh, I talk to experiencers. They have not only seen those beings that you mentioned, they've seen Egyptian gods, you know, the, the, um, the, um, the god with the dog head, um, uh, Ganesh with the elephant head, you know, from India. And these are scientists. These are credible people. Um, we had... Um, I won't, mean, I won't give you any clues, but <laughs> uh, um, um, someone that won a major Academy Award, okay, uh, uh, a person seeing a physical being just sit in, you know, in, in their home, large being, okay, I won't give any more clues, okay, but just to let you know that people from all walks of life, they're seeing a whole vast array of these different types of quote-unquote beings. And we really don't know if that's don't what know. they look like. We don't know whether Ganesh actually came or whether this was just some type of per, um, uh, 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 projection, okay, that, 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 uh, that you're perceiving because they put so much into your mind that you could perceive almost anything. Like, for example, who's the man that uh, sees the owls all the time? Mike Cleland, okay? Tons of owls, you know, six-foot owls interacting with him all the time, you know. I doubt, and he doubts, that these uh, six-foot owls actually exist, but these are projections that they're physical, they're real, just like as you and I are talking. One other question, uh, you mentioned Dr. Mitchell. He was on the board uh, of NIDS, National Institute for Discovery Science, worked with Bob Bigelow, and a really excellent 
a world-class group of scientists, and they had a living laboratory, a place called Skinwalker Ranch, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which seemed to be the Disneyland of the paranormal. It's everything you can imagine was all there in one place. UFO activity and orbs, poltergeist, crop circles, Bigfoot, uh, dimensional portals, all at one place. Um, and the question is whether or not whatever it is that's there is trying to tell us it's a learning curve. These are all related. It's all the same thing. I think that's the message. I think that's the message. Uh, certainly John Alexander, Dr. John Alexander, certainly understands that. All of the members of our board certainly understand that concept, that it's all interrelated. In terms of asking more profound, big questions, <laughs> after that, who knows? I mean, we're totally clueless. This is, uh, I consider this the world's greatest jigsaw puzzle that in our generation, we're not going to uh, solve that riddle. We're in kindergarten. We're in, no, we're in pre-K. We're in pre-K. Uh, okay. To begin to even learning how to talk the language. Um, but yet we know it exists. We still don't know. The vast majority of, of society doesn't know the complexities of it, especially the field of materialist ufology. They're just focusing on a UFO, on Rendlesham Forest, on, on Roswell. To me, it's like, please, give me a break. You know, Let's focus on the real issues here, the complex issues. And we leave, believe that the experiencer is the key to be able to you know, pull out the golden nuggets. Okay.